a great speaker. Um, Dr. Clark is here, and uh, I think you may have heard him speak before, but he's going to talk to us about heart disease and how to reduce our risks. At the end, we're going to be doing the drawings from the Rewards for Life for the end of 2012. So stick around for that. I'd like to introduce Lynn Noel, who's with Baptist, our partner in this wellness initiative. Welcome, Lynn. Hey, everybody. How are, how's the day going? So we have Dr. Davis, not Dr. Clark. <laughs> Um, but y'all, thank you for coming um, to our talk on heart disease, Baptist Health, and Arkansas Cardiology are partnering together to bring you Dr. Scott Davis. And uh, although he was born in Memphis, he was raised in Little Rock and went to school at Baylor, came back to Little Rock and was educated at UAMS for medical school, and then back to Texas um, for part of his training. Um, at the Texas Heart Institute, he got his fellowship in cardiology and was the chief fellow there, uh, 97 to 98. Dr. Davis is married and has four children, um, teenagers, and all of every. His, you know, one redeeming factor is he, he's a member of the Little Rock Razorback Club, so we Amen. we know he's a good sports fan. Uh, and if he doesn't mind me mentioning on uh, his CV that I got, he's also a businessman and has a t-shirt company. So he's a well-rounded individual. Yep. Um, in 1998, um, special training in intervention, interventional cardiology. I'm not sure what all of that income uh, compasses, but he will tell us about that. And he uh, is on staff at Baptist and at St. Vincent, St uh, director of cardiology cath lab at Baptist. So thank you so much for coming. I'm going to give this to you. And Thanks. I'll just use this level. Can you all hear okay with this? this is, my voice kind of carries anyway. Um, welcome. Thank you for welcoming me. And I um, have been here a few times before, so glad to be back. I think I spoke here one time. I think I spoke like at an Embassy Suites thing one time. Anyway, um, thanks. And uh, I hope to make this interesting and not boring. Nothing worse than a lunchtime lecture you've got to just wade through. So. Um, let's talk about cardiovascular disease, shed some light. If what I'm about to tell you doesn't make any sense, just stop me and let's talk about it. This is, needs to be informal. Um, let's talk about just the disease incidence and prevalence, talk about just how the pump works, how the anatomy works, and then let's just talk about major types of cardiovascular disease, what we can affect, control, what we can't control, how to prevent it, and, and, and how do we diagnose it. Um, no shocker, but we live in the kind of the buckle of the belt of cardiovascular disease in the United States. Um, like I tell people, as long as McDonald's and R.J. Reynolds are in business, so will I. So um, um, it, more people will, will die, I, a sobering statistic, no, more people will die from cardiovascular disease than disease, disease processes two through five combined. So uh, for as much as we've done in the research and, and the growing knowledge base that we have in the last several decades, we got a lot of more, we got more work to do. Um, cardiovascular disease is the leading, leading cause of death in the United States. It accounts for uh, over a third of all deaths in the U.S. Uh, from 2005 statistics, and those are not showing any sign of changing. Uh, cardiovascular disease has been the number one killer of uh, folks in the U.S. since 1900, and that was due to the uh, flu epidemic. Um, about 2,400 Americans die from cardiovascular disease every day. And, and this is an emphasis that we always like to uh, focus on. Among women, uh, one in less than one in three people will die from cardiovascular disease. And I say this often, but I'll say it again. For as much emphasis as we put on breast cancer awareness and uh, cervical cancer awareness in women, and, and for as much emphasis, and the Susan Komen Foundation has done a wonderful job, more women will die from cardiovascular disease than die from breast cancer or cervical cancer. Doesn't mean we need to ignore it or put it on the back burner. It just means that we, we probably should do a better job on our side of taking a page out of Susan Komen as far as you know disease awareness, and so hopefully we'll make some inroads in that today. Um, it, it's an age-related disease process. Cardiovascular disease is. I mean, you know, it, prevalence just increases as we get older, and so um, you know certainly stuff starts happening after you turn 40. But it doesn't mean you need to be ignorant of it if you're not yet 40. Um, and we'll talk about you know what you need to do as far as kind of starting to own your risk, right? Uh, some things to do to help you uh, have a better awareness. Um, 
let's just spend some just a few moments talking about how the heart works, all right, and and kind of what some of the phrases and terms mean. You know, the, the cardiovascular system includes the heart and all the arteries that come off of that, as well as the venous return to the heart. It's a four-chamber pump we all remember from science class back in school. Uh, it'll contract some 100,000 times a day. There's two upper chambers, the atria, two lower chambers, the ventricles. So the, the thing I always tell people, make a, a fist with your right hand. Make a fist with your right hand. This is the, the audience participation. Put it over your chest like this. That's the same size, shape, and location of your heart. So your heart is the same size and shape as your fist. Now, there's a, there's a row of knuckles that goes right down the front right here. Can you see them? Right? That's, the, that's, the, that's the passage. That's where the left anterior descending artery goes, right? The LAD that you hear about, the Widowmaker artery, goes down the front of the heart, and it courses it like a pipe. So if you laid a straw, a drinking straw, or a pen over your, these front knuckles, this is what your uh, LAD looks like, okay? It goes right down the front of the heart. At basically a right angle, at, 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 at the same plane that, that these knuckles go, is the circumflex, which circles to the back side of the heart. All right, so you got the LAD going down the front, circumflex goes to the kind of the side and back part of the heart, and then like, like the base of your palm, kind of arching like the base of your palm is the right coronary artery. So as you start thinking about then the anatomy of the heart as it relates to the overall gas to the pump, there's three main arteries that supply gas to your heart. So when we start talking about cardiovascular disease, we're specifically talking about the risk and the likelihood for developing a blockage in one or more of those heart arteries. Then when you start talking about, well, I had bypass surgery, my uncle had bypass surgery, I had, a, had an aunt that had bypass surgery, that's what we do. We, 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 we bring in new pipe to go around a blockage. When there's a blocked artery, and we'll talk about this in a little more detail, the, the mechanics of, of improving blood flow where there's a blockage is nothing more than fancy plumbing, right? And there's, there's basically two ways to address a blockage. You can either open it from the inside, that's what I do, right? I, put, I, I go in and, and, and it's a fancy video game, really. It, you, you look up on a screen and we're able to see through an angiogram what the blood flow looks like, put a stent across the blockage, expand the stent, open it up, and scaffold open the artery from the inside, right? That's angioplasty, that's stent. So that's, that's, that's the one way of mechanically improving blood flow. The other way is we just completely bypass the blockage, right? Hence the term bypass surgery, where you take a new piece of conduit, usually vein from your leg, right? And use, and use that so that we'll go around the blockage. What makes the heart unique as a pump is that it not only supplies oxygen, pumps oxygen to the rest of the body, but it also pumps oxygen to itself, right? So your heart not only sits here, so as you get this mental image of my fist is in the middle of my chest, that's where the heart sits. The big pipe that comes off of it, right here where the, you know, the round part of your fist is, that's where the aorta comes off, right? That's the main artery that comes off. The, those, those arteries then, the LAD, the circumflex, and the right coronary artery, they're the first pipes, they're the first blood vessels to come off the aorta. So the first oxygen that the heart sees is right out, right out of the gate, right? So it, the, 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 the oxygenated blood comes from the lungs into the left side of the heart, and immediately when it comes out, the heart gets oxygen right out of the gate. It, it supplies itself to then supply it. And so as you continue to look at the system, it's an exquisitely design system. And for those of you that are spiritual, you can see it's a very God-made thing. And so, um, um, so that's the basic mechanics of it. So then when you look at this, this kind of looks, for me, it's cumbersome. And I, you know, it's, it's hard for me to get my head wrapped around some of these diagrams that you'll see, but it starts making more sense, right? Because there's four chambers. So we start with the, so when you look at this picture, think about you're standing like this. So this is the left side of your heart. It's not like looking at a mirror, right? It's like I'm standing right here. It's like looking at somebody. So left side of the heart is here, okay? And so what happens? Here's another important um, concept. Can I draw on that? Can I draw on that? Do y'all have a, you have a marker? Oh, hey, there's a marker already here. Cool. So... I want you all to see this and not get in the way of my thing. So th this is the best way to think about the heart, okay? Can you all see right here? Okay. So look at this. This is the way my simple brain has to think about it, okay? So four chambers, right? Okay. 
the main workhorse chamber of the heart's what? The left ventricle, okay? And so it does the majority, the lion's share, the pumping function of the heart, okay? And it pumps oxygen out to the body, right? Well, I, I'm used to doing this upside down for patients, sorry. There we go. Via arteries, okay? Follow me so far? So we pump to the body. The body takes up all the oxygen it needs, all right? And once all the oxygen is taken out of the, the bloodstream, it sends the blood back via the what? Veins, right? You guys are smart. Right atrium, okay? Right ventricle, and it sends it over here to the what? Lungs. So we'll do some lungs and we'll do a little O2. Where we got oxygen, right? We get more oxygen, gets put back into the blood, sends back over here to the left atrium, left ventricle, and that's the, its job, okay? That, it, it, that's in a nutshell what the heart does 100,000 times a day, right? It just, it continues to pump oxygen from the lungs to the rest of the body. So here's the main principle to also understand about the body, right? The heart sits in between the lungs, which is kind of low pressure, okay? And it pumps oxygen up a hill to your body, right, which is what? Normal blood pressure is what? 120 over 80. Follow me? So the heart, lungs, so think about pumping water out of a ditch, okay? You want to drain a ditch. You got to pump it uphill, right? So you got to have a pump in the middle. So normal lung pressures are 30 over 10. Normal circulating blood pressure is 120 over 80. Heart sits in the middle, it's got to pump it up a hill. And then once it does it, it passively comes back over here to the lungs, just downhill in the veins, all right? So whenever we start compromising pumping function of this left ventricle, then if the system backs up, where does it back up to? The lungs, right? So whenever you have a heart attack and you damage this pump, then you can have what's called heart failure, right? And then heart failure is usually signaled by what? Shortness of breath. Because the, the pump is backing up. And when it backs up onto the system, it backs up into the lungs. Okay? Simple things like, um, so it, it'd be the same thing. It would be the equivalent of, all right, if I took your car, your truck, all right, that's usually, say, a six or eight cylinder motor, and I cut half those pistons out of it, right? you could probably get around and do your normal routine, right? You could probably get to work and drive 40 or 50 miles an hour, right? But if you needed to step down the gas and pass somebody, you'd be a little more sluggish. If you were used to having an eight-cylinder rig, but now you just have four-cylinder motor, right? Going up a hill is going to be even tougher. What if I strap a ski boat to the back? Or what if I load it down with half a rick of wood or a full rick of wood in the back of your pickup truck? Then you're really going to be dragging, right? Which is the key thing to why we want people who have had heart disease to get skinny, right, and to pay attention to their pressure so you're not either carrying around extra weight on that system and or you're not having to drive up a steep hill all the time, okay. That's why blood pressure is so stinking important, right, because look, if, if, um, let's do this. So if, if heart's here, okay, and blood pressure's here and lungs are over here, right, oxygen, 30 over 10, right, and so i got to pump this up that kind of hill, right. What happens if you're walking around 160 over 100? All of a sudden that hill starts getting a lot steeper, right, putting more work on this guy. That's why it's so important to keep your heart, your blood pressure under control. And so that's why then lowering blood pressure does more than just lower a number, right. For any of you that are on blood pressure medications, that's why it's so vitally important to do more than just get this number under control because it makes the system work more efficiently that you can't always see because the problem is just kind of like drive, you know, if you bought a new rig, right, you bought a new car, you bought a new truck, and you had it for a couple, three years, but every day you drove up this super steep route to get to work, every day. I mean, it was steep as all get out. You know, you'd have the radio on, and you might be working your cell phone, and you just wouldn't be paying attention to any kind of drag on the motor. And that's usually what happens with high blood pressure. People have high blood pressure, but they don't walk around going, doggone, man, I feel about 165 today, you know, just kind of, you just, and that's it, but you don't, you don't, not, I mean, if you do have high blood pressure, and if you do know when your pressure gets, say, north of 150 or north of 160, you are blessed, consider yourself blessed, you're in the minority, but you are very, it's, it's, it's a good thing that you do know that, because most folks don't walk around that way, and that's why it's such a booger 
That's why these talks are so important, so people kind of start owning this, but then to know that it's more than just a number, right? It's more than just some red printout that I get on some video screen from my automated blood pressure cuff that I have at the house or at the local Wal Walgreens or Walmart. It's because day after day, you know, I tell people this every day, having high blood pressure day after day, you know, one day, one week, one month is no big deal. It's month after month, year after year that starts doing, having a negative impact on the wear and tear of your heart. Moreover, if you are on blood pressure medicine, understand that the role and goal of those therapies is more than just treating a number, right? If you're on a class of medicine, like say it's called a beta blocker, it slows down your heart rate, it brings down your blood pressure, and it helps the pump pump more efficiently. That is beneficial to you long-term mortality-wise, right? Not to get too philosophical with you, but you go see the doctor for basically two reasons. Live longer, feel better, preferably both. Oftentimes when you come see me, in the, you know, short of having a heart attack that I fix and, and help you feel a heck of a lot better, some of the medicines, I'm, I, you know, I put you on cholesterol medicine, you'll go, oh boy, man, I feel great now that my LDL 70, you know, because you don't. I mean, you don't, you don't feel that. That doesn't make you sleep better at night, maybe say for a little, you know, relief of anxiety, right? But long term, it, I got chapter and verse on the mortality benefit of why you will live longer on that therapy, okay? I really digressed on what I was talking about, but it's important that you guys understand um, how all that fits together. And if you've got questions during any of this, just stop me and let me know. What do I do with that thing? Hey. Yeah, right. So yeah, yeah. So when you when you pledge allegiance, start putting your hand here if you want to be. Here. But but now think about it. When you do CPR, right? What you, everybody's taking basic ACLS CPR classes, right? You don't start cracking on the pushing on the chest over here, do you? You, st you do it right here. You compress, you compress the sternum, the breastbone, against the spine, right, and, and, and the heart's in the middle. Now understand, just, just so you understand, when you're doing CPR, okay, the, 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 you're not pumping for them, you're creating a billows effect. It's, 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 the, it's the relaxation part that's filling the heart again, that's moving the blood, not the pushing part of it that's actually pushing it out. It's sucking blood back into the heart each cycle. Does that make sense? But anyway. That's a sidebar. But yeah, your heart's, your heart's smooth. I mean, it's, it's the old, there, there's an old, there's an old uh, uh, med school question in anatomy. You know, the whole, if you shot an arrow through somebody, name all the structures that would, you know, go through the skin and they go through the bone and they go, the first chamber it would hit would be the right ventricle, right? That's, that's, that's how your heart's sitting right here in your chest. So that, this, hopefully, I don't know, what kind of time do I have? I don't want to, I want to leave plenty of time for yeah. When do y'all have to be back at work? Three, three thirty. <laughs> um, so as you look at as you look at this, the basic schematic of the pump function, this makes this look a little less busy. I hope so that you go, okay. Here's what Davis was saying. Here's left ventricle. So it, you know, the the the, the left ventricle is going to pump out of the aorta, right? So here's your fist sitting here, and there's your aorta sitting. At the t there's the valve right there, like your like your fist, and here's the aorta coming out. Okay. Everything circulates, circulates, and it comes back through the left atrium, through the right, excuse me, through the right atrium, through the right ventricle, and it goes up into the lungs, okay? It's a little bit off from this diagram, but you get the basic, basic flow pattern, right? So here's the left atrium here, here's the left ventricle, pumps out of the aorta. I mean, it's an exquisite system. Uh, we, we've covered all this. The right atrium gets the deoxygenated blood um, uh, and goes into the right ventricle, goes to the lungs. All right? And there's, there's basic pump function. So predominantly, it, when you say heart disease, we're talking basically about coronary, coronary artery disease, right? Blockage uh, of, of, uh, of an artery. Um, all angina is, if you ever read that in an article, is it's a fancy $25 medical term to say heart not getting enough oxygen, okay? Um, here's the way it works. If I, you ask me to go out and run a marathon, I get about two and a half miles into it, my legs start cramping. Why? Because I am asking my muscle to do more work than the amount of oxygen I'm, I'm providing to it, okay? So, the... the and then the, how, do you, how does it get better? Well, you stop running, right? So you know, then, then the, the cramping goes away. When you, when you don't have enough oxygen to the heart and it starts to cramp, okay, that's called angina. All right? It's just because you're asking, the, and, the, and the heart obviously can't rest. That, that'd, be, that'd be curtains. But, it, um, but, but 
the, the, but but it you know it is a scenario where boy walking up that flight of stairs doc I mean it was just like elephant sitting all over my chest and I sat down about three or four minutes later it got better right that's the typical scenario of angina and arrhythmia is just an irregular heartbeat and it can come in a variety of flavors congestive heart failure is kind of like we said it is when the pump the pump cannot meet the the metabolic needs of the of the body and it the system backs up into the lungs typically. Then you got a whole host of congenital and rheumatic heart disease issues, and then we can we'll, we'll talk briefly about stroke. Um, the, the the bulk of the breakdown of of death is from coronary disease, but you can see kind of where stroke fits in there, heart failure, and other. Um, let's talk about atherosclerosis. Um, um, when you look at the risk factors for coronary disease, and we'll talk about those a little bit more in detail, there are basically six, right? Guys get heart disease more commonly than women do. Folks with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetics, smokers, family history. That list becomes pretty obvious which ones we can control, which ones you can't. You can't pick your parents, right? But, but you can leverage, get off the smokes if you're a smoker, get your blood sugars under control if you're diabetic. And keep your cholesterol down, okay? And it's clearly been shown that driving your lipids into the dirt is beneficial, all right? Both from a secondary and a primary prevention. Now, what do I mean by that? Secondary prevention is the medical code term to say you're already in the club, right? If you ever read about secondary prevention, that means that you already got it, and we're trying to have it happen at secondary time. Okay, so you've already got coronary disease. We don't want you to have more coronary disease. You've had a heart attack. We don't want you to have another heart attack. So we clearly have shown by driving your cholesterol down, 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 it, it reduces your risk of developing another event. Okay, but then the next question is, hey, doc, I don't want to have it to, to begin with. Yeah, we've done that study too. Okay, we've looked at if, you, if you're at risk, you know, dad had a heart attack at 48. Uh, I got an older brother, had bypass surgery at 52, and I don't want that to happen. We've shown that, yeah, even if you haven't had coronary disease, being aggressive about your lipids is a smart thing to do. Uh, a couple of thoughts about that. There are, here's the way you got to envision the whole lipid thing. Let me see what this next slide is. I'll, okay, great. So here's the way you got to think about it. Um, cholesterol in and of itself is not a bad thing. Right, it's a basic building block of cell membranes. Okay, so it's an important part of the architecture of the body. We just don't want cholesterol being deposited where it doesn't belong, namely arteries to my head or to my heart or other other places. Right. So there's basically, you know, there's 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 the two types of cholesterol you've always read about: good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, HDL good, LDL bad. What does that mean? Well, what we're looking at is basically two paths, two sides of a street. Okay, from your GI tract into being deposited in your artery wall or being mobilized from your artery wall and eliminated in your gut. Okay, LDL, bad cholesterol. That represents the pathway of cholesterol that's being mobilized from your GI tract and deposited in the artery. Okay, of your heart, neck, kidneys, legs, wherever. HDL, good cholesterol. That's the other side of the street. That is cholesterol that's being mobilized from your artery wall and being eliminated in your GI tract, okay? You obviously want the HDL, the good cholesterol, to be high because you want that pathway from your artery wall to your GI tract to be robust. You want the LDL low. You want a minimal amount of cholesterol going from your GI tract that's being you know, consumed in your diet and being deposited into the artery wall. Now, some people genetically just have been dealt a, a less favorable hand, okay? And no matter they could have the religious asceticism of a monk and eat cardboard all day and their LDL is going to be whacked, okay? And that's the goal of, and role of medicines, okay? That's statin therapy. Does it mean that if you're on statin therapy, you get a free pass to, you know, eat a 40-ounce steak every night, right? But it just means that genetically, that's something you're predisposed to, but it is something you can leverage, okay? So I highly encourage you to know your cholesterol. Just just know it needs to be an annual part of your screening. So as, as time develops then, cholesterol continues to build up inside the artery wall and can make it more narrow and more narrow, all right? The question is, is what's a heart attack, okay? And that's something we need to talk about real quickly just so you know the difference. When, when cholesterol gets deposited slowly and indently over time, 
all right, then what will happen is the, the pipe just slowly narrows down, like the drain of your sink in your kitchen, okay? You, you know, you develop gunk and hard plaque in the drain, and eventually it kind of clogs up, okay? It, it, it'll, well, it may not even clog up. It just, you know, that damn kitchen, that, that, we've got to get the plumber in here. This thing just doesn't drain. It takes forever to drain, right? Everybody's got that sink in their house. But what's the difference between that and, um, and a heart attack, okay? Here's what it is. Imagine, imagine an artery looks like this, okay? It's a pipe, okay? Blood flows this way, okay? Now, over time, we'll start getting some plaque development on, in that artery, okay? Okay, just some junk. And then it might get a little, more, a little worse. Now, it may be, if we did an angiogram on it, right? We took one of those fancy pictures I was talking about. You may look at this and... And this may only be, say, 40, 50% narrow, okay? Not, not tight enough to, to, to cause any kind of uh, symptoms, but it's starting to be present. So what's a heart attack? Let's do a little physics here real quick, kind of flow physics. Our blood flows this way, okay? There's a concept of shear stress. You just have to take my word for it or Google it after we're done where the highest impact of, of shear is right here at the shoulder region of this plaque up against this artery wall. That's where the most force is of the, of the flow of the vessel, and this is the weak part of the plaque, okay? Now, as plaque is developing quickly, okay, because of genetics, bad diet, smoking, and diabetic, diabetes, this shoulder region right here is real thin, okay? Understand, this segment here, this segment here is blood flow. This is the cholesterol. This is maybe just a thin little cap right here. It's not thick at all. And all this inside here is just cholesterol gunk, goo, all right? I know you guys are eating and trying not to gross you out, but um, uh, the way I describe it is freshened up gum. Everybody's chewed freshened up gum, got that heart outside, and you bite it down, it's got the little gooey inside. That's exactly what that's like, okay? If this fractures, if this cap cracks, okay, what happens? All of this goo extrudes into the artery lumen, okay? And it's not that that, it's not that, that, that cholesterol gunk is necessarily going to clog the pipe. It is a magnet for platelets. And what do platelets do? Form blood clot, okay? Three types of, three types of blood cells float around in your blood, okay? White blood cells fight infection. Red blood cells carry oxygen. Platelets form blood clot. That's all well and good if you cut yourself shaving or you nick yourself on a rose bush. But we don't want those platelets to be sticky in this setting. But that cholesterol core, when it gets exposed to the blood elements, it turns on platelets and man, they clump together like that. Bam, 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 and it accelerates. I mean, it just, it, it's very fast. When all those platelets start to clump together, that's what forms blood clot and that is a cork in the pipe. That's what causes a heart attack right there, okay? So what do you do? How do I avoid having this? Number one is by, by lowering your LDL, okay, diet, exercise, quit smoking, get your sugars right if you're diabetic, and getting on statin medicines, this plaque stabilizes, okay? So instead of having this thin fibrous cap, it kind of hardens, just like the drain of your sink, right? It, 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 what used to be that soft kind of junk on the inside of the pipe now gets hardened. It doesn't go away, it's just hard up against the, the, the pipe. And, and, and so, and the inside of this now hardens, okay? Dries up, for lack of a better term. So, the old question is often asked, hey doc, if I quit smoking, lose weight, get my cholesterol under control, go to church on time, will this all go away? Will, will, will I get what's called plaque regression? And the answer is, yeah, in about 30% of, of 100. About 30% of people will actually have plaque regression, but all will get plaque stabilization. Does that make sense? So it's a bit of a stretch to say, oh yeah, if I get my mind right, you know, you have a come to Jesus with your doctor, and it's all, you know, that your plaque's gonna completely disappear. That there is no Drano, there is no gum out, there is no janitor and a drum pill that will guarantee that. But what it will do, so this goes back to the old thing about Look, mechanically, bypass surgery stents treat symptoms. Medicines reduce your heart attack risk. Got me? That's why I take your medicines, okay? If there's one take home message, stay on your medicines. So, cholesterol, lowering your cholesterol, right, 
reduces, makes this a stable plaque. Aspirin a day keeps these platelets from being sticky. Lowering your blood pressure lowers the sheer stress inside the blood vessel right here to reduce the incidence of having that happen. That's how all that plays together to improve your mortality, improve your longevity. Does that make sense? Y'all follow all that? Questions? Yeah. It's okay to eat anything, man, in moderation, right? It's it's the Tibetan monk rule. Okay, you could, you know, the we'll talk about the dash diet here in a minute. You know, yeah, you need protein, but we'll talk about diet here in a second and how it begins and ends with carbohydrates. That's the key thing you got to keep in mind. And I'll show you about that. Show you about that in a second. Um, I, I've kind of jumped. I'm kind of reading off the menu here a little bit. Sorry. Um, coronary disease, heart attack, or an MI. This is myocardial infarction. Um, is the fancy term for a heart attack where you just all of a sudden you put a cork in a bottle like we talked about and you just stop blood flow immediately. Um, coronary thrombosis when you form a blood clot we talked about. Embolus is, is one that just dislodges and goes downstream and then collateral circulation is where you got to understand this in your in your mental images of, of, of the imagery I'm kind of trying to paint of this whole thing. Yeah we got three main arteries but you got to think about look the, the the gas to the pump is not just three PVC pipes. Okay, the, 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 the circulation of the heart is like the root structure of a tree. You got main big, you know, base trunk roots, but they what? They divide out and they go rootlets, okay? That's how, that's how the vascular supply of the heart works. I mean, if I were to sit here and draw, I'm sorry if I'm using up all your paper here. So if, if I were to, you know, if I were to draw, draw your heart out, you know, and it comes out kind of like this, right, like that. So you've got, and, you, and you've got three arteries, right? So you've got a left main that'll come like this, and it'll, it'll go down the front of the heart, and it'll branch off like this, okay? It'll have these little septal branches, septal branch, and it'll come down here, and then it'll go to the, this will come off down here, okay, like this. And then you've got an artery that circles around the back side of the heart like this, the circumflex, It'll come down the AV groove, and it'll give a branch off, and it'll give a branch off, and then it'll throw off a branch down here. And then you'll have the right coronary artery, which of course down here like this. And it'll have a branch here, and a branch here, and this will kind of do like this, okay? So it becomes a very elaborate network of arteries, okay? And so there's this concept, there's this question that often comes up, well, hey, Doc, can I grow, a, uh, can I grow new vessels? This is usually the way it's phrased. And the answer is, eh, sort of. And so if what can, you know, if, if this artery blocks off slowly, okay, if it narrows slowly over time, and by that I mean decades, not, you know, six months, then you'll, you will start having these branch arteries that will come off, these little twig arteries that will come off right before it, okay, that will do like this. And they'll go in all different directions, okay. And, and then... Then it, and then this artery will come in here and it'll throw off some branches, right? And this artery will throw off branches. So that this region of the heart right here, even though you got this blockage, it kind of have, has compromised flow, right? It's the, it's the same concept as you've got a nice, you know, you've, you've got this nice crepe myrtle or, you know, pick a tree in your yard. And one day you're digging and you're trying to do some, just some soil work. And, man, you, you get a little too deep with your shovel and, man, you cut a root, Right? Well, same concept. The other roots will pick up the slack of that root that you cut. That doesn't mean that tree is going to necessarily die. Now, you cut that root off too close to the trunk and you will compromise it, right? You, you develop a blockage so far upstream that there's just so much real estate involved. Yeah, you can't, that, that's, that's, that, that's problematic. But do you understand the concept that if you slowly develop a blockage, that little tributary branches will perk up to pick up the load and, and, and carry the load, okay? Um, Let's see, where are we? Angina. Uh, so, like we said, all angina is is when you've got compromised blood flow in reduction that, that um, uh, affects then the, the the pumping function of the heart or, or the the work that's being done. All nitroglycerin does is dilate uh, blood vessels. Okay, but it can't dilate a blockage, right? It, 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 there is no gum out. Okay, um, beta blockers help to help the heart to pump more efficiently. Um, 
arrhythmias, uh, when we talk about that, it's just uh, an irregular, but I don't want to get off into the whole atrial fibrillation thing. It's a, it's a whole other 30-minute conversation. Congestive heart failure is, it, it is typically due to damage because of a heart attack, but it can come from a variety of things, like a cardiomyopathy. What's that? Cardio, heart, myomuscle, pathy, not work right. So it means that the heart muscle is not pumping effectively, but it could be for a variety of reasons. It could be from what's just an idiopathic cardiomyopathy. We don't really know. Probably a virus that somebody had contracted. It could be due to some exposure to a toxin, like a chemotherapeutic drug, right? It could be uh, peri there's, a, there's a condition that's kind of rare, but it happens in peripartum cardiomyopathy, pregnancy-related kind of. So, it, 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 you know, the, these kids with these hypertrophic cardiomyopathies that we, that we unfortunately see sometimes, you know. Um, but but it, you don't just have to have coronary disease or heart attack to have poor pumping problems, okay? Um, the, 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 the valvular thing, you know, uh, congenital, and, you know, we've gotten rid of a lot of rheumatic fever in, in the United States. I mean, it, it, if you go and do any kind of mission work or work outside the U.S., especially in Mexico, you'll st still see a fair amount of rheumatic, rheumatic disease. Um, what's a stroke? Um, a stroke is when you've got a narrowing of the artery, but that a piece of plaque and or blood clot will, f will break free and go to your head, okay? And, and so, that, you know, I think that l l talking to people in this setting and just dealing with patients, this is probably our bigger fear than a heart attack, right? Th this, this is so associated with uh, a long-term disability and a burden to family versus, well, if I have a heart attack, I'm going to die. I'm not going, you know, I'm not going to be a burden to anybody. But this is, this is viewed more, and so, but, you know, and this is very real. Um, but you, the risk, the risk reduction that you would achieve by getting off cigarettes, by getting your blood pressure under control, getting on an aspirin a day, lowering your cholesterol, will directly impact this, just like it will directly impact your, cardi your cardiac risk, okay? Um, this is just a nice schematic little cartoon diagram of showing the difference between a thrombus, which is a clot, an embolus, which is a mobile clot, hemorrhage, which is where you bleed out of the artery, or an aneurysm. That, that's anatomically, can you, can you see the difference? I mean, that's just clot that's formed in the artery wall, thrombus. Mobile clot is an embolus, okay? Hemorrhage is just bleeding, and then aneurysm is just like an like a inner tube of a tire that's got a weak part of the wall. That's all that is. Yeah, well, it, it, yeah, blood, blood's all of a sudden where it doesn't belong. And, and the problem with that is blood bleeding to your head's a problem because it's a fixed space. It's a box that you can't expand. That's why if you, you know, I mean, when, when people do hemorrhage into their head, there's a compressive effect, you know, because all that blood starts pressing on the brain, your brain doesn't work right. And again, I got to, I, I think real simply, and um, I mean, that's what they, they do, they have to drill a hole in your skull to relieve the pressure. So they do have to put a bolt in your head, and it doesn't sound real palatable right now, I understand, but <laughs> that's, what, that's what happens. I mean, that's, it's just, it's, it's basic pressure hemodynamics where there, all that blood's pumping into your, into your head, and we can't turn, can't shut off the valve. And it's got to go somewhere, so you got to you got to drain it. So what causes an um, Two things. One, it's congenital. Okay, you just you're born where you know it's just part part of the artery is just weak. Part of the the lining of the artery is weak, and there's no way there's no way to know. I mean, you know, you, I mean, if 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 you ha if you're one of those that has a story where you know grandma had a berry aneurysm that got you know then died from a stroke. Mom had one clipped when she was 48. Well, yeah, th then you need to talk to the neurologist and probably get a head CT, get screened for that. But it's congenital, and then it's also driven by other factors, just like stroke and just like cardiovascular disease. I mean, obviously, that's going to have a higher likelihood of being weak if your pressure is 160 than if it's 110, right? So it's directly impacted by those factors, too. Um, so what can you do? T some take-home practical, you know, stuff y'all can digest here uh, on the heels of all this. Um, you know, like I said, you can't pick your parents. You can't change your, your genetic profile. You can't change your genetic load. Um, you know, you can't control how old you're getting um, and, and can't, you know, can't, can't pick, pick any of these things. But you can affect a fair amount of risk. And, and I can't beat this drum 
strong enough, you quit smoking. You know, I mean, there's a couple of facts about that. Number one, nobody lived longer by smoking more. Okay. Number two is everybody that smokes think it won't happen to them. You know, they won't be the one that gets lung disease. They won't be the one that gets cancer and they won't be the one that gets, I mean, I've, been, I've lived it. All right. I've walked in those moccasins. Okay. And so, and I'm an educated heart guy. I understand, but nobody quit tomorrow, you know, and, and uh, not to beat you up about it, but I'll tell you what's got to happen is two things. Number one is you got to go home and throw them away. Number two is you got to quit buying them. Nobody put a gun to your head saying, hey, man, you got to put this thing in your mouth and light it up. And, and, and that sounds simple, but it's damn hard to do. I understand. But, the, it, the, but until you get to, and whether it's you or you got a family member or friends trying to quit, until you spiritually, metaphysically get to that place, don't kid yourself. Until you can go home and throw them all away or, and, and you can commit to quit buying them then don't kid yourself with chantix, gum, hypnosis, you know, chicken leg over your shoulder, whatever it is. It, 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 I, I cannot tell you the number of times that people come in and they're just, you know, that damn chantix doesn't work worth a flip. Did you quit? Well, no, I haven't quit yet. I'm down to half a pack. Well, no, you, 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 you get, there is a sequence of events that has to, you have to quit first and then you take the crutch, not the other way around. Look, it's an addiction. It is an addiction like heroin. Nicotine is wicked, wicked stuff. And you've got to take a page out of the AA handbook, right? You talk to any card-carrying member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they'll tell you straight up, look, I may drink a fifth of whiskey this weekend, but what? I ain't going to do it today. And it's one day at a time. I may smoke a carton of Marlboro Reds this weekend. I just ain't going to do it today. And that's the way you got to look at it. One of my best friends quit smoking 15 years ago, and he dearly loves cigarettes. And he will tell you straight up, I love everything about cigarettes. I like the way they smell, the way they taste, the way they make me feel. I enjoy smoking. I just choose not to. And that's the way you got to look at it. So that's my little, that's my talk. Enough. Um, quit smoking. So let's, we're going to talk about the DASH diet, but let me just make a few comments about saturated fat, cholesterol, and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's got to be a balanced diet. If you wanted a, go and get, the, go Google the DASH diet, which is from the Heart Association. It's like the um, uh, diet approach to uh, stopping hypertension, I think is what it stands for. And or South Beach diet. The, 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 the success, the key to any successful diet, and I think diet's a four-letter word. I hate, I hate that term. Um, but but the, the key to, to why, the, the key to successful weight control, let me say it this way, is number one, making wise choices. Number two, understanding the, the relationship between carbohydrate and insulin, because it all begins and ends there, right? We didn't have the weight problem that we have in the United States until we started making fast foods and, 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 and foods that were high in carbohydrate. And if you look at the relationship between fats and carbohydrates, most of the foods that we eat t today disobey any natural order of things, right? There's a disproportionate amount of fat and carbohydrate that you don't find otherwise in nature. You know, that you wouldn't otherwise, living on a farm, living out in the woods, go and kill and eat or grow and eat, but that's the way we do it. And what does it end up doing? It disrupts the insulin levels in your body. When you're, the goal, the body's homeostasis is designed to have insulin do like this, okay? Nice, steady states of insulin. Diabetic who's on insulin pump, what's the goal? Nice, uniform delivery of insulin. Because what happens when insulin starts doing this? You yo-yo. And what happens when you yo-yo? You eat like you've been in, you know, a prison camp for three months. And then you're, uh, and then the insulin skyrockets and then drops again, and then you go and eat it. The goal is to avoid this. And bulk carbohydrates do that, okay? So it's not just eggs. It's not just, you know, uh, fried stuff. But it's, it's, it is in toto what ends up happening because it's a disproportionate relationship between, you know, chips and cheese dip. Well, that, that makes, I mean, that, that from a nutritional standpoint disobeys every natural order of things, right? Because it's high carbohydrate, high fat. Right? Those two never go together, naturally, right? So the key is South Beach diet, heavy on fruits, heavy on vegetables, and let that be your, your complex carbohydrate rule of the day. 
with a modest degree of protein, minimize it. And, then, and, and it's a challenge. I mean, look, breads are good. But the way we eat bread in this country is just, it, I mean, it, you know, and I'm guilty as the next guy. Don't get me wrong. Hey. Yeah, I mean, there's, well, you don't want my editorial on some of this, but what, what ends up happening in a lot of these things is with globally, with the whole need to grab an eyeball, whether it's on your cell phone or it's TV, where research has gone now, instead of it being well thought out, largely designed trials to, to look at answering some of these hardcore questions, what we've done is we've really streamlined it to the point that we want to get the data out so fast because we want to have you back reading our website tomorrow, right? And so here's what happens in a lot of those studies. The word may starts creeping into it. Such and such may be associated with heart disease. Well, depending on where you are in your life, oh, well, hell, man, we're all going, you're dying, you know, or... But if you look at the hard data, it is, well, we did a pilot study, and we only had 50 people, and of those 50 people that we enrolled, this and this happened, okay? My point is this, that may, there may be some truth behind that. There's a lot more research that needs to be done in it. But as you read the USA Today interpretation of the latest Journal of American Medical Association article, pay real close attention how it's, it's structured. The other thing that happens statistically, um, is, is this, and this is what you really got to pay attention to, because we got into this whole thing a few years ago with like the whole Plavix debate and, and taking blood thinner or taking uh, uh, stomach medicines. Let's say you and I do a study, okay, and we're looking at, we're looking at uh, my new drug uh, and, uh, versus a placebo, okay, and we, um, we look at 2,000 people, okay, and um, uh, of that thousand people, okay, and this is the placebo arm, okay, of that two thousand people, uh, six people die, okay, on on sugar pill, on on just placebo, okay, and on on my new drug, only three people die, okay, All right, absolute statistics, you go six out of thousand versus three out of thousand. You know, that's, that's not that different. Oh, hell no, I'm 100% I'm, I'm, I'm better. <laughs> See, I, I showed a 100% reduction in the disease process and give me my FDA approval. And that's exactly what happens. So, and that happens all the time. Not in, just in our world, but it's statistical, you know, I mean, you know, it's, what, what's the old line? If you don't have the facts, make sure you know the statistics, right? Yeah. Yeah, all right, so that's a great question. So, five minutes, okay. Um, all right, we'll just answer questions. Um, I, I don't think I've got, I think I've hit everything I wanted to. Yeah, cholesterol, triglycerides, great. We'll talk about all that. So, um, so that's the, there's the, the, another type of cholesterol, and that's the triglycerides, okay? So, LDL bad, going to the heart from the GI tract, HDL good, going from the you know, heart artery to the GI tract, being eliminated, and then triglycerides, which you kind of just free floating, haven't declared a path, right? They may go to your heart, they may go to your gut, we don't know. So we just kind of flip a coin and run it right down the middle, okay? Stat, if you got really high triglycerides, you definitely need to be on a statin for sure. And then fish oil has been shown to directly impact triglycerides. Here's the wrinkle. There's only a couple of FDA approved statin drugs like Lovasa, and it ain't cheap. But it has been FDA tested and approved. The kicker with the way drugs work, over-the-counter, GNC, vitamins, St. John's wort, all that kind of stuff is, until it kills somebody, it's legal. Okay? The way the FDA works is, until it hurts somebody, or we formally tested it, it's legal. Okay? I'm old enough to remember the drug ecstasy. All right? Anybody that went to college in Texas or Arkansas in the 80s knew about ecstasy, right? There was a window there where it was a cosmetic drug, and it was legal. Why? Because it's legal until the FDA says it's illegal. So there was a, like an 18-month window where you had all these boutique folks cranking out this drug and selling it for 20 bucks a pop at all these, you know, clubs and stuff until the FDA finally said, no, nah, no, nah, you know, people are getting brain problems with this. They're not thinking right. They're, you know, and so then they made it illegal. So 
all of these supplements and stuff are, are legal, but they're not under FDA control. So be real careful about what you're getting. In other words, don't, don't let yourself slip into the, and the XC example is probably a, a, a far reaching one, but you get the idea. Don't let yourself get lulled into the security of going, well, you know, I take a, I take a, a fish oil once a day and I ought to be just fine. Well, I still would come back to make sure you know what your cholesterol is. And if it's high, get on a statin drug because that has been proven scientifically to lower your heart attack risk and mortality rate. Get on an aspirin a day unless your doctor says you shouldn't be or you got a GI problem or an allergy to it. Make sure your blood pressure is well under control and then get, you, get off cigarettes, exercise, do all those things. Not saying you shouldn't do the fish oil, but I can't tell you the number of times people come in there and go, well, no, doc, you know, I'm taking these vitamins, I'm taking my fish oil. It's like, well, how are we doing the smoking? Well, I'm down to two packs a day. So it's like, well, you know, <laughs> you know it's, it's the whole, it's, it's the whole, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to drink a Diet Coke, but eat a Snickers. Well, you know, you're not. Yeah. So uh, any more questions? I appreciate y'all's patience and time. Yeah. Yeah, well, sodium is a magnet for salt. Okay? And it's just going to cause you to hang on to it. Look, sodium, if you're 29 years old, ain't no big deal. What you take in, you pee out. Okay? But as you get older and if you're prone to having high blood pressure, it will cause volume retention and drive then the, the, the actual volume piece of the blood pressure curve, right? Which goes back to what is still one of the main tenets of antihypertensive control, a diuretic. So it's just, it, it all has to do with how you hang on to water. Yeah? All right, understand this. Stress never causes anything to come out of the clear blue. You know, I can't tell you the number of times I've talked to the wife in the ER when, you know, after a heart attack, the guy's had a heart attack. Well, he's been under a lot of stress. Well, stress didn't cause him, didn't cause that cardiovascular disease to come out. Now, stress will cause things to come to the surface that may be linking, you know, lurking under the surface. But yeah, healthy stress relief, you know, needs to be exercise, not your second scotch each night, right? So, I mean, find, find a healthy, and that, and that goes back to, going back to this, the, the alcohol thing and the research thing, it has been shown that a glass of wine with an evening meal has been beneficial. What has not been shown is, this goes back to that research conundrum. People that drink a glass of wine have been shown to have healthier lifestyles, but then people that choose healthier lifestyles typically drink a glass of wine a night. So which is it, right? Because people that drink a glass of wine a night tend to be a little bit more self-aware, tend to be more self-educated, and tend to make better lifestyle choices. So is it those people that just coincidentally have a glass of wine a night? That, that, that piece is now. Now, Welch just did a study about 15 years ago that actually looked at the tannin piece of grapefruit juice, and that was beneficial. So if you teetotalers, you get the same benefit with a glass of Welch's. Yes, sir. Yeah. Unfortunately, in our line of work, there is no mammogram. Okay, there's no true screening test. Okay, what happens in that whole cholesterol piece? When when cholesterol c continues to collect in the body, the body's response is it deposits calcium where there's cholesterol. Calcium is real easy to take a picture of. Okay, if I take a chest X-ray of you or me, it's easy to see. You know, here's the ribs and here's your spinal column, here's your collarbone because there's calcium in your bone. We can exploit that with a calcium score, okay, or a calcium scan or a heart saver CT. It's, it's, it's marketed by different things. And it gives us an idea about lipid cholesterol burden. Not if you've got one focal blockage, overall plaque burden, okay? So then I can look at your cholesterol and say, well, Mr. Jones, here we go. We got a total cholesterol of 220 and your LDL is 140. And you know what? Your calcium score is kind of getting up there, bud. We really got to get aggressive with your lipids. Here's your prescription for Lipitor. We got to get got to get our mind right. Conversely, here it is: 220, LDL is 140. You don't have a family history. You're not a smoker, and your calcium score is zero. I can tell you with more confidence. You know what? Let's let's just make some dietary changes here. Let's let's just look, work on lifestyle. I bet you if you lost about 15 pounds, we might be able to make a dent in this. But we're not seeing the end product here. Okay? So it does kind of help put you in a different bucket, a risk bucket. All we're doing in these in these strategies is risk identification. You know, are you basically low, moderate, or high? Okay. Same thing for the stress test. Stress test is a diagnostic tool, not a screening tool. And so be careful about that. Statistically, if you all have taken statistics, there's a host of difference between what, what you would expect in a diagnostic format. Because if you come in saying I have chest pain, right, it hurts, my chest hurts, and I put you on a treadmill and it's normal, you've gone from an intermediate risk down to way low risk. That means it's zero, 
But I can say, well, you know, it's probably not your heart. I can put you down here in this low risk category. Conversely, if your stress test is abnormal, that moves you from the moderate risk to the high risk. Make sense? What else? Yes. Um, boy, I think jury's out on that, and that's, that's one of those FDA things. Um, again, you, you, there, there's a certain amount of common sense to s things, and it's like, wait a minute, man, I'm, I'm, I'm doing, you know, I'm doing mega doses of something here to make me feel this way, you know. I, uh, I mean, coffee's been around for a long time. I, I would just drink a couple cups of coffee. I, I, <laughs> I don't, you know, and I, I mean, but, but see, that, th therein lies the problem. What hasn't been done is... Nobody has done a randomized study to say, all right, what is the incidence? And, 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 you know, you've got all these anecdotal things. You know, i got a cousin who lives down in Texas, 22-year-old guy, man. Almost had a heart attack on that stuff. You know, and you, you hear all that, you know, thought he had a stroke. And, um, and, but, but nobody's really done that. It, but, you know, going back to the stress issue, you know, that's not where you want to find out you've got some underlying conduction abnormality. You take that stuff, and all of a sudden it's a, just a big, you know, shot of adrenaline in your arm. Um, I'm not going to, you know, I, I don't drink it. You'll have to make your own call on that. It's not against the law, too. Anybody else? Yes? Um, I don't know if it's... If, if, what that probably parallels is anything that, that is going to promote deconditioning, right? You know, it, it, and that's why these kind of workshops, these kind of talks are important. And the, the whole wellness wave that, 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 that's, that's kind of taking hold in corporate America to say, hey, listen, every two hours, get off your fan and go walk. You know, take your lunch break and get 15 minutes. You know, you need to exercise some a day. I mean, that's just that's the way God made you, you know, and, and it's the way we're built. You need to exercise some and put some miles on your tires. But I don't think it's necessarily that, you know, sitting on your fanny, it, that's it. It's what you're not doing because you're sitting there. You're not exercising, you know, you're not walking around. I know, I know I've run, out of my time, run over my time. I appreciate you guys. Holler if I can do anything for you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Sure. And I